All right, my man, Camel, welcome to the show. I really, really appreciate you coming on today, man. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Excellent, man. So yeah, it's been kind of hectic uh, this morning. I know the Euros are about to start and I'm, I'm running a Euros bracket. So I had a few people texting me with questions and stuff like that. Um, but first of all, I want to ask you, is it coming home, man? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, every year it's allegedly coming home or every four years uh, and every two years for the World Cup. But we are the country of disappointment when it comes to football. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. It, it, it's not a stop. It's, it's not a smart bet. I don't think. Yeah, man. Maybe they're waiting to turn it on because, I mean, they definitely have the talent, of course. But uh, my mom is German, so I've always been a USA and Germany fan. And so, um, you know, since 2014, it hasn't been great for Germany. But at the same time, I'm like, if that's what you have to go through to win a World Cup, then I'm like, I'll sign up for it. You know, it takes a long time to rebuild. But yeah. um, So we'll see. I mean, I think it's one of the most wide open Euros I've ever seen. So we'll see how the whole tournament goes. But um, yeah, I remember watching like last Euro and man, I think whenever I saw the guy in the stands who couldn't even watch the penalties and just had his face in his hands, I was like, man, I really feel starting to feel bad for England because <laughs> I'm like, this guy paid so much money to go to the Euros and he doesn't even want to watch the penalties. Like, I was like, come on, man. Like, I, I think the, the, I guess just England not winning has gone on so long that I'm like, okay, like, come on, like they got to get it at some point. Like, let's go. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not super into football. I I will occasionally watch the England sort of uh, in in the World Cup or if they get through a few rounds the the early rounds in the Euros I I might watch a couple of those games but I can tell you for sure it means the absolute world to everyone here. It really really does and a couple of years back when we got quite far in the World Cup the the vibes were just elevated for the whole country during that whole lead up. And uh, yeah, it really, really does mean the world to people. So I I'm not at all surprised that people can't can't, can't watch the penalties. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just it, like, go ahead, it, go ahead. Yeah, it's a country that takes football very, very seriously. A hundred percent, man. As as far as I know, and I'm I'm not really qualified to talk about football, but I, I think it's that we've got all the good players, but they don't play well together. That, that's my understanding. Um, yeah. I, I, I kind of feel like there's so much pressure on the team that it kind of goes the opposite way. It's like one of those things where the less you care, the better you do. And they know they have so much pressure at all times from the media, the fans, stuff like that. Like I watched that David Beckham documentary where he got the red card in the World Cup. And it was just a bad call because uh, Diego Simeone, who's now the coach for Atletico Madrid, he just kind of like faked a fall and got him a red card or something. And yeah, so, right. like, the fans didn't forgive him for, like, years and years after that. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just watched that documentary, too, about the last Euros and what was going on at the stadium. And it was literally, like, people were already naked, so wasted in the streets outside Wembley. And they were, like, <laughs> and it's not even 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's the England. That's, that's England for you. That's just how it is here. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, man. Well, if you guys win, I won't be mad, dude. I'll be happy for you guys. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so I'll tell you, man, I kind of uh, found you guys, your or your channel back about a year ago, I want to say. Um, and you probably know your stats better than I do, but I'm pretty sure I was about subscriber number 887, something like that. Um, and I think in that time you've just crossed 15,000 followers or subscribers and that's pretty amazing growth, man. Uh, so I, I just wanted to kind of ask you about your channel and kind of the, the story of the last year or so. Yeah. Well, thank you for being a channel OG. Um, it, it's kind of crazy. I, I, I hoped it would do well, but I never really thought about it in terms of, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting it to be at 15K. I hadn't really thought too hard about how quickly it should grow or ought to grow. I always approached it knowing it was a very competitive space. There are thousands and thousands of like crypto or trading channels out there. Um, and I largely just thought if I just show what trading looks like in the real world and try to have like a more transparent approach to it, then that might give me a leg up on some of the competition. But I primarily do what I do because I want to help people, not because I'm trying to <laughs> collect exchange referral money or anything like that. Um, yeah. And I think it's been 
it's been a very humbling experience and the community has reached a level that I didn't anticipate at all. People send me <laughs> uh, camel finance type AI music oh, where, yeah. they, where they train <laughs> AI based off of the things I say and people send me artwork and people send gifts from all around the world and postcards to the PO box. And yeah, it's just incredibly humbling really um, to see that a lot of people resonate with it and the amount of people that come back and tune in every day seems to be significantly higher than other channels with a similar or uh, yeah similar amount of subscribers so so yeah it's just an incredibly humbling experience to be honest and like i say i just want to i just really wanted to show what trading actually looks like and show that it can be done because i think there's a lot of sort of altcoin scammery and pump and dumps in the space um yeah so, so yeah i mean it's something I love to do because because I don't have a nine to five. I, I just trade. I have plenty of time to actually post consistently and respond to comments and things like that and manage the channel, which obviously I think a lot of people that sort of do it on the side, they they don't have that luxury afforded to them with the time component. Exactly. So I'm quite uniquely positioned to be able to, you know, dedicate as much time as I, as I, I need to or want to. Um, but, yeah, I just really enjoy doing it and I just want to continue doing it the way I've been doing it and see how far it goes, really. Absolutely, man. And and just like we're talking about, it's like sometimes things are counterintuitive. And when people are looking to get something out of YouTube, like as a person who's making the content, you know, customers can feel that or subscribers. And when you don't really ask for anything and you're giving away so much, people want to give back to you. That's, you know, the law of reciprocity, of course. And I think it, it just kind of like makes people love you that much more because you know you're not trying to just like hustle people or go make money off people you're literally like you said just trying to help people and you've helped me i can tell you man like uh the past year since i found your channel it's been the first year i've ever been successful investing and i started late like in 2020 um but yeah i i probably lost about 25k trying to trade over the last three years uh, which, yeah, it's pretty significant amount of money, but it's just sure. like you add, uh, you start to like just become reckless with your uh, risk. And then you just start, once you start losing, that's when it's easy to get, uh, just continue that roller coaster. And then uh, since I found your channel, man, I started just kind of like looking at the trends, the way you, you post them. And it's helped me, like I cashed out that same amount of profits earlier this year. And so I was able to actually like de-risk out of crypto a little bit and put that into other investments, put some in the family fund and stuff like that. So that felt amazing, dude, after three years of not being successful. That is really awesome to hear. Um, I've got, I had a giant smile on my face the whole time when you were talking. Uh, yeah, that, that's why I do it, right? That's why I do it because there's so much information out there that is motivated by other things. And I think it, I was a trader first and a YouTuber second. So mm -hmm. I think that, again, gives me like a slightly different perspective, whereas I think a lot of people get into trading and they maybe try it for a few months or whatever and then start a YouTube channel and then suddenly they realize <laughs> trading is harder than they thought it was. So then they not, they're not in a position to say no when they're offered these sorts of financial incentives and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I'm really happy for you, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's helped. And as ever, if, you know, if people can put in the work and see how it looks in real life, then it, it can be done, right? It can be done as long as you manage risk and put risk management first. So, so yeah, well done. I'm happy for you. Thanks, man. Yeah, it, it's, it's, I think it's really cool because what you've done is you've kind of simplified it because I used to watch all the channels, you know, I watched uh, Gareth Soloway, which I know you love him. <laughs> uh, but it's just like you try to figure out all these different patterns and just things like that. And I'd be looking at charts sometimes and I'd, I'd think something was this way or that way or try to guess which, you know, type of pattern it was. But the way that you showed and you were like, look, all you have to do is look at this trend and then you draw a line. Once it crosses down below that line, the trend is broken. So like literally all you have to do is geometry. And if you just ride that trend, you can take profits off the table at certain levels. But I mean, a big mistake that I used to make was I was, you know, I started trading in 2020. Uh, and if I had stayed away from options and just, you know, been long term smart, like buy Bitcoin, buy other things like, you know, Zoom, things like that, obviously, in hindsight, it's 2020. But at the same time, like, I knew things were going to go up. But my impatience is what killed me. My fact, my desire to achieve like immediate results and want to see that number go up so fast, 
you know, it's, it's another counterintuitive thing. It's like the more patience you have with your account, the better off you do, because, you know, it's already 2024 since then. And if I had just been buying and holding and taking profits along the way, I would have been four to 10 times more successful in what I've done over that time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think in many areas of life, the simpler you can make something, the the more efficient it actually is. And I'm kind of a believer that if you can't simplify a process, then you don't really understand it. So that's where that whole trend line thing came. And the cycles give me the context to know whether I can be confident in a trend line or whether it's probably a fake breakout or breakdown, whichever side it is. So I think the system is super simple. I think it's super effective too. And and yeah, you are absolutely right about long-term focus. People tend to massively overestimate what they can do short-term mm-hmm. and massively underestimate what they can do long-term. Mm-hmm. And simply having an approach that, because I think a lot of people fall into the trap, right? A lot of people say, well, I just need to make a million or two million and then I can put my feet up and relax and live a nice life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the reality is if you're lucky enough to make that kind of money, and you haven't developed the literacy and the discipline to keep hold of it, then you're just going to lose it as quickly as you made it, right? You're probably going to make three or four more trades after you've hit that number, whatever that number is, and then end up broke again. So yeah, I think aiming long-term is super important. I also think there's a million ways to make a million bucks and trading is probably the hardest way to do it. (laughs) I think a lot of people underestimate this and think that oh, this is quite easy. You just have to buy the right altcoin or do this. But like I say, if you are lucky enough to make a bunch of money very quickly and you haven't developed the risk management and the discipline to keep it, you know, making it's a lot easier than keeping hold of it. So having that long-term focus definitely helps. And I think so long as people can can do this with a long-term view, then you know, as long as you focus on that and focus on managing the risk, then it really can be done as I, as I try to demonstrate every day. Absolutely. Yeah, I I kind of have had that goal as well of, you know, and I understand like you think about an an arbitrary number sometimes. But for me, I wanted to hit this goal of hitting becoming a millionaire net worth by the next five years. But I think a five year goal is somewhat realistic. And even if I do or don't hit that goal, it kind of keeps me in a long term mindset of, you know, I think I started that goal about four years ago, but four years ago, it's just been a learning process uh, to get to this point where I'm finally starting to see success. And what success looks like is actually just not trying so hard and just letting time do what it does. I think that's an important principle I've learned is that, you know, if I if I just like continue to have a long term mindset, continue to invest, take profits when things get a little crazy, and then, you know, just like look at other ways to invest and look long term. The market is going to do what the market is going to do. But I think having somebody like you to listen to and help balance perspectives. And I think that's that's a huge thing is, dude, I'll tell you my story with crypto is, I mean, I started I almost bought Bitcoin in 2017. I had some money and then I could have taken it in Bitcoin. Um, and basically I got scared away by the wallet address thing. And I think oh, yeah. it was like, I was like, I don't know about this. Let me just, you know, get cash or whatever. So I could have put that money in Bitcoin. It was about 200, 250 bucks, something like that. So I would have probably had a third of a Bitcoin or a half of a Bitcoin at that point. And I looked about a year later at the price of Bitcoin and it was, you know, almost 20,000 bucks. And I was like, dude, I can't even imagine that was that would have been life changing for me at that point. Sure. And So I passed it up at that point. And then by that time, I was like, all right, let me go learn about crypto, basically. And so I tried to put in some money. But, you know, I was like the ultimate buy at the top person at that point because everything was super overvalued. You know, Bitcoin was 20K. uh, Ethereum was, you know, 1400 or so. And then I think like starting in 2020, again, when I was getting in my trading, I got on like an email list from somebody and I basically I uh, got an email from this guy saying there's an altcoin that's about to explode, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like laughing inside as I hear talk, hear myself say this. But I went on Coinbase and I tried to figure out what coin he was talking about. And I he said it was under four dollars. And somehow I figured out that he was talking about Chainlink. So I put in, you know, like a thousand bucks on Chainlink or something like that. Uh, and within a few months or a month or two, it had gone to like almost eight thousand at one point. And oh, wow. I was like, dude, this is amazing. I've never had anything like this before. And I've never seen any kind of returns like that on a 
thing that I would invested in. So I was immediately hooked. So I started, you know, trying to put in as much money as I could here and there uh, over the next like year or so. I think I invested something like, you know, 15,000 total into crypto. Um, but the problem was I was listening to all the wrong people and I wasn't, you know, listening to myself. So I was like following people like BitBoy Crypto. And I just am like, dude, like that is to me, I'm just like, no, don't do it, man. Like now. Um, and so basically I rode that 15,000 up all the way to hidden my like max was about 86,000 at the, at, in 2021. And it culminated the peak was like, I had that Decentraland coin and it, after the Facebook changed its name to Meta, I think it profited 25,000 in one day. And I was just like blown away and I sold <laughs> I sold it all. And I was like, dude, I, I got to sell it. Like, and then I, instead of just take, I think like what I've kind of learned is when you have that moment of euphoria that you can't believe something just happened, that's when you walk away, you know? If, if you're at like a blackjack table or something and something crazy happens and you hit 21 off of complete luck, that's a good time to stop. You know, so like I take that philosophy and that where I could have walked away there, had life changing amounts of money. And I knew it was time to sell because I would go to sleep at night, wake up in the morning, check my phone and be like, is my money still there? And that's, <laughs> that's how you know you're uncomfortable, uh, you know, and you're like, that's time to de-risk. But in that time. Like you said, my short term mindset was like, all I cared about was like, I want to make enough money to pay off my mortgage. And I had this unrealistic goal. And I was listening to people like BitBoy and saying like, Bitcoin's going to hit 100K guaranteed, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, if it's going to hit 100K guaranteed and he has an inside source or whatever, um, let me just like, why would I sell now? Let me just keep waiting. And within about a month, my portfolio dropped about 50%. And I was just like, oh, can't believe, like it hurt so much. And, you know, my rookie mentality was like, I can't sell now. I ha it's just going to come back, <laughs> you know, and it's the same. Like I'm looking at this uh, market psychology cheat sheet in my mind as I'm saying this. And so basically I waited and waited and waited till it drops and then it drops some more. And eventually um, I think it I lost probably 60 to 75 percent of that portfolio. And then my tax bill comes and all the profits I had left were basically gone from taxes. Right. So I had to basically start from scratch. Oh, and the crazy thing was I had that money on like the rest of my money in Voyager because I like the interface. I got wrecked. I got wrecked on Voyager oh, as well. No. Because, yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, sorry. Keep going. Keep going. Well, I'll tell you real fast. Like basically Voyager. I put that money into USDC because they were given 9% interest at the time. And I thought I was a genius for doing that. But then the whole Terra Luna thing happened. And I was like, dude, USDC, I don't know, man. Like, I'm just getting out. Like, let me just take it off, take it off and put it in my account again. And within a month, uh, Voyager shut down and I was, and they wouldn't let anybody get their money out. And I only had 40 bucks in there at that time, luckily. But I, I think they gave me 14 out of the 40 back eventually. But yeah, I was so lucky to even get that money back because I would have lost everything from the jump. But it's still it took a few months of just like getting like that was a gut punch right there and a hard lesson, but valuable. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. So I think we've all been there and <laughs> I know I have. Right. I know I in my early career, I used to make I used to trade penny stocks on London's AIM, the alternative investment market. And they've always got a bunch of gold miners and oil miners and the truth is none of these companies ever find any gold or oil, <laughs> um, but occasionally they release a bit of news and these things pump and dump like altcoins, mm -hmm. right? And that's how I got started. And it's funny you mentioned about buying Chainlink and then, you know, some short while later you in this huge amount of profit. And I, I think that's kind of like the the hook because I experienced this as well. When I, when I bought my first stock or my first group of shares in some old mining company, it just so happened to be up about 400% in the first nine months. And mm -hmm. because of that, I interpreted it as, oh, well, this is easy, right? This is how the rich <laughs> get rich. They just put a bit of money somewhere and nine months later, it's worth four or five times as much, right? And I often look back at that as a real milestone to my career because if I had have put this money in initially and it went to zero, I may have concluded that the stock market was a scam, hmm. right? And I just so happened to get completely lucky 
make four or five X my return. And then mm -hmm. I could only arrive at the conclusion that this could be done. This could actually change my life, right? So it's kind of similar to you buying Link and watching it go up. But again, in the early days, everyone has made this mistake. Absolutely everyone has caught a pump and you described it so perfectly, right? You catch a pump and then you're thinking I should sell and then it goes down and you go, well, I can't sell now. It's down 50%. I might as well wait for it to bounce. And then you kind of end up holding and holding and holding and you round trip the whole position. And I've certainly done that. I think pretty much every investor or trader is guaranteed to do this at least once in their career. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the difference between the people that make it versus the people that don't is many people will round trip the whole thing, right? And then sell at the bottom, conclude that it was all a scam or it's not for them. And then they just quit and walk away forever. And so we get this kind of burn and churn industry where new investors show up, they buy the top or they, for a while they're in profit. And then, like I say, they round trip the whole position, maybe even end up with losses. And then they kind of quit and, and walk away forever and they never come back. And I think that's why we see so many people that have stories of, oh, I know so-and-so that had some stocks and shares and they went to zero, <laughs> right? I think everyone knows somebody that kind of got wrecked somehow in yeah. the stock market or a pension fund, or maybe they went to a financial advisor. I certainly know a bunch of people like that who, who have a story, I mean, of somebody that had a bunch of money in markets or was invested or whatever, and eventually they got wrecked. And I think if you're going to, if you can weather all of that and then say, okay, well, what did I do wrong? Let me reassess. Let me figure out <laughs> where I could have sold or how I could have figured out what the right time to sell was. Those types of minds can make it in this space. But it's funny. I, I honestly believe every investor and trader has exactly that same story. I know I do. I know I did it more than once. Okay. If, I think if you're smart, you'll only do it once. <laughs> I, I have made all the mistakes there are to make and I've made them all half a dozen times each. So maybe I'm pretty dumb. But I think if we can learn from these and then build a system around it to kind of avoid that, that certainly helps. I also happen to get kind of wrecked in Voyager as well. I hmm. was spread betting the the shares for the company when it was when it was listed, and <laughs> it kept breaking out and doing fake breakouts. And so I kept mm -hmm. buying the breakout and then getting stopped out, and then it would break out again. And I'd be saying to myself, "What's well, in a bull market? It's going to break out again, right? It's going to run higher." And I mm -hmm. kept getting stopped and stopped. And then all of a sudden, I got massively gapped down on. The company goes bankrupt, and I took a, a good chunk out of my account uh, through trading Voyager, which was which was kind of rough. But I mean, at this point in my career, it wasn't like it, it didn't really damage me. You know, it was just. It was just a chunk that I wasn't really willing to give up. But I didn't I didn't get completely liquidated or anything like that. But I do remember if you go back and look at my equity curve in my spread betting account, you can see that there's a big there's a big peak in there that doesn't belong. And that is from the Voyager collapse. So so, yeah, I feel your pain with that one for sure. But but as with many areas of life, I think as long as we can make these mistakes, there's nothing wrong with making the mistake. As long as you don't shy away from it, as long as it doesn't make you quit, and instead you come back and and learn from that mistake, then you know if you can stick around, you and learn from your mistakes, you you can certainly make it. Absolutely, I, I think like for me, I just kind of looked at it and I said, what I what I like about crypto is that the market cycles exist, and I think the fact that there are market cycles helps me understand it a lot more than I understand most stocks and what's going to happen. I think it, it operates a little bit different than the stock market. And I like it because of that. Um, I know that there are, you know, tie ins with the reserve and all the things like that. I, I mean, I do want to say, too, that it's just about like taking those lessons from it and saying like, hey, even though I said I'm following, I was listening to BitBoy Crypto, like I take responsibility for those losses. It's ultimately my fault because my body or mind was trying to tell me like, hey, you're uncomfortable with this amount, you know, like you need to take money out. But greed overcame that. And just like it's all the famous quote, what you know that just ain't so. And you're, um, you're if you're guaranteeing Bitcoin to go to a million and you believe it and you think that's going to happen instead of looking at it and saying like, hey, you have a life changing amount of money, go take that out and do something with it and be happy with it. You know, be happy with what you got, because four years from now, you can just keep, you know, reinvesting that into like smarter, long, longer term plays instead of trying to make it all in one hit. And, you know, of course, it's like the home runs thing. You strike out a lot when you try to hit a home run every single time. But yeah, it's like I take responsibility for all that. And I think what I, I realized is when you're a new crypto person and you go to YouTube and you just look up crypto, it's the channels that you find are kind of hilarious um, because it's just clickbait, 
um, you know, shock face, that types of thing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I do remember even Bit Boy having a bit, a couple videos where like, I think it was January of 2022, something like that, whatever it was, like Bitcoin had just crashed a ton. And his channel or his video for the day, it was like Bitcoin pumping, massive bull rally continues. And Bitcoin was up like one to two percent, if that. I'm pretty sure it was less than two percent. And like it's just to get the clicks. And you do a good job of having exciting titles, but it's not clickbait. And I think that's what I want people to to look at is to say, if you're listening to somebody that has a huge following, um, most likely you're part of the herd. You know, there are exceptions to that, of course. I think there are good channels out there like. I like Elio Trades. I like Coin Bureau as well. Um, you know, they're not, I think they are like, there's different aspects of each and there's exceptions, but you just have to understand, like if you're listening to a person who has a ton of following and they're using a ton of clickbait and it, it's serving them, not you. And if you're listening to somebody like Camel, it's more educational content. And and when he's trying to help, you're trying to help other people, like it's pretty obvious in that case. So I think people need to look at that. But when you're new into the space, you don't always realize that stuff. And I've kind of honed in my following to people where I'm like, I think most of the people I've listened to on YouTube, I only listen to like you and maybe one or two other people, but you guys are all about the same amount of subscribers. And I feel like the channels like you actually have the most value to provide. Thank you, brother. I mean, we've certainly all done it, right? (laughs) We've all... We've all got, what's the word, FOMO, when our favorite influencer says, oh, I'm buying this coin or that coin, or, you know, we've all made decisions that are lazy and we know in our soul they're lazy. You go, well, I'm just going to take that because this guy probably knows what he's doing, right? Or I'm just going to copy this or that seems attractive. But again, it just comes down to these lessons, right? And and you're absolutely right. You you have to take accountability and responsibility for for your own decisions. At the end of the day, no one puts a gun to your head and tells you to copy whoever you see on the internet. And I think even... If at least in my experience, if I've ever copied a a trade from someone, even as I'm doing it, I'm like, this is this is wrong. Why I shouldn't be copying someone? I should be doing my own thing, right? And occasionally they work out, but but yeah, it, it's not a strategy. And I think it, it is easy because, like I said earlier, this is kind of a burn and churn industry, right? People come in and they they kind of buy the tops, and then they conclude the whole thing's a scam once they round tripped the whole position, and then they kind of leave forever. And so these larger influencers. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a product of being a larger influencer, but the influencers that are more focused on these sort of pump and dump kind of deals, they they can get away with it because the people that are going to suffer are going to quit within three years or less and then never come back, right? Mm-hmm. They're just going to walk away and conclude that it was a scam. But you do have to operate in this realm of, with an attitude of trust nobody, trust nobody at all, <laughs> least of all me, right? Trust no one at all. And just try to be as what's the word try to adopt as much scrutiny as possible i think is is the best yeah. procedure for all investing and trading and in terms of the clickbait stuff i mean fear sells right that's yeah. the reality the, the mainstream media does this all the time right how often do you see a positive story on on the right. mainstream media? right you never see it because fear sells that's what grabs attention and to a certain extent i play on this i, I play to this a little bit you know like mm-hmm. i have to play the game because i'm a youtuber right. i just have my picture of my badly photoshopped camel head no one's <laughs> clicking that so to a certain degree i have to play the game i have to have some kind of title and some kind of you know thumbnail that suggests it might be worth clicking on um, right. but i try to at least have an element of truth there so it's not just total clickbait and right. i'm certainly not one of these people that sets everything on fire in the thumbnail and pretends like the world is burning down exactly <laughs> which i do see quite a lot but and, and obviously I, I don't have the face melting stuff but but at the end of the day the game is the game right attention is a new currency in a way and i, I don't i don't judge people for doing it if mm-hmm. your primary source of income is youtube you're probably going to have to play that game to some extent and then again, it comes back to financial incentives. And I can tell you, because with my moderate subscriber count of 15K, I have been offered significant sums of money to mm-hmm. shield things and mm-hmm. to partner with exchanges. And, you know, if I didn't have a normal job, if I, if I wasn't a trader, if I didn't sort of have my, my ducks in a row, so to speak, then that kind of money would be massively incentivizing versus what YouTube ad revenue pays, for example. 
you know? So I don't, <laughs> I, I don't condone it for sure. And I definitely think morals and ethics needs to play a big part here, but I can understand because if I look at my YouTube ad revenue and it's paying a couple of hundred bucks a month and then an exchange reaches out to me and says, Hey, Camel, we'll give you 10 grand in Tether mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'll give you commission on everyone that signs up. And every time they make a trade, we'll give you a percentage of the fees. Then, you know, if I, if I didn't have a normal job, if I didn't have other sources of income, that would be super, super incentivizing, <laughs> assuming I had no morals as well. Right. So yeah, uh, the game is the game. Right. But I think so long as people understand how the game works and where the incentives lie and what to look out for, then, you know, you, you can avoid it. And, and it, it just is what it is at the end of the day. It's a burn and churn industry. Like I said, you know, people have a, a life expectancy of three years or a career expectancy of three years on average in this industry. So if you, if you've here longer than three years, right. Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> yeah, it takes it. I didn't realize it would take that long to learn, but I think you just have to find the right thing that works for you and just, like not have impatience, like you said, but I agree, man. I think there is a difference between like, I understand like you need hooks, you need attention. Uh, you need like people to actually click on your video and that's part of YouTube. I think there's part, there's a part of it to that, but it's like, you can do it in a, you know, a cool way and still get people to click. I think Ben Cowan is like the ultimate example of like not trying with uh, his titles and uh, thumbnails. Basically it's just that he's happened to have that following already um, but yeah, he, he like never uses any kind of punctuations or anything. And uh, it's, in, or it's interesting how he does it, but he's a, he's a super exception, but I think, you know, like you said, it, there's, then you can go to the complete other side and just put things like BitBoy had like Dogecoin to $5 and then just getting the people to click on it. And <laughs> yeah, I think he got really into it with Pompliano about it. And he was like really pissed off in this interview. And he was like, dude, he's like, that's an unrealistic price target and you know it or something like that. But I think the culmination for me was whenever I was watching his channel and he was in a parking lot after a college football national championship game. And I remember he had a video that just said, and it was him standing in the parking lot and the title was, I sold all my crypto. And then in the video, he's like, I didn't actually sell all my crypto. I just wanted <laughs> you guys to watch the video. And I'm like, dude, you're burning everything like like with the stuff like that. Like people are just like, nah, I don't even care anymore. Like we're, we're over you. But I think now he's gotten a lot of hate over the years. And I think it's it's on me, like I said, for not doing my own due diligence and things like that. But I'm I'm happy to have found uh, a channel like yours because like I said before, once I hit that amount in my account and I had, I was like, let me just sell, you know, a part of my account because I was like, I'm at a point where I'm like, dude, this is life changing money again. And so I learned that lesson and it, it felt good. And within, I mean, this was in March or April, whenever things were kind of peaking out and within about a month of that, I would say my portfolio would have dropped again about 70% and at least probably because of altcoins and stuff like that, retracing. So I was pretty happy that I made that decision, but you know, it's just one step in, in the chain. But I realized, you know, if I had just been buying in 2020 and saying like, I think Bitcoin was 6K and trying to just stack things over time and let, and I think another mistake I made was trying to go all in on an, on an altcoin back in 2022. And I picked this one called Gala and I think it was like three cents, but I put a huge amount of investment in it, but it didn't have much. It, it got up to four or five. It got up to eight eventually. But at the same time, I was I, I had been holding it for so long with no action that I just once it got to four cents, I sold a majority of it. Then a couple of weeks later, a week later, it went up to eight and I could have made a little bit more, but I was just happy with the profits that I made. But just buying something that's more medium risk is to me, you know, just as good because like Solana is probably my favorite altcoin. And that's if I had bought that instead of the same in the same time that I bought the Gala games, like Solana is a top five or top 10 coin and it's gone basically seven to 10 X since last year. So you don't have to go for like the deep most degen of the degen altcoins, like even Bitcoin, you know, since 15 K is what like five X basically. Yeah. I mean, Going back to what you were saying about the the thumbnails, the the thumbnails right are a super weird balancing act because <laughs> if you go super clickbaity, then people won't watch the video. And the thing that harms the algorithm the most is if people click the video and then leave in the mm. first thirty seconds. 
right mm. so going back to that it's the thumbnail thing is a is a sort of fine balancing act and you know for example you said with bitboy saying i sold all my crypto and then you click on it and he the first thing he says is oh i didn't really sell it then you're probably not going to watch the rest of the video right you're just like ah oh, god he, he got me <laughs> so that's kind of weird but to your point right sell culture is a strange thing in the cryptocurrency space there's a whole heap of bitcoiners that say things like i'm never selling never selling right and i understand in having a hodl stack that you decide i'm going to keep you know this portion of bitcoin forever just in case they shut the off ramps or you know this is i'm going to leave this to my grandkids and my children whatever i completely understand that but it doesn't exist in the stock market like i've never seen anyone say oh, i own apple stock but i'm never selling <laughs> right? yeah it, it just seems super weird to me but it certainly exists in a lot of places in the crypto space you know hold forever or hold for all this time and certainly spending some time holding crypto can give you the performance but these assets are so volatile that holding them forever is really not a good strategy in my opinion i think especially given the cyclical nature of many of them including bitcoin especially bitcoin you know if you sell somewhere close to the top and you can miss the top by 30 or 40 percent mm -hmm. and then miss the bottom by 20 or 30 or 40 percent and you could still double your stack because that's how volatile it's been his in historical cycles right so this whole idea of oh, I'm never selling, I'm just going to hold forever, doesn't really fly with me. But it is it is a strange observation that I make that there's this weird sort of sell culture around that. And to your point about holding Gala or not needing necessarily the more degen tokens, position sizing is everything for me. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people want to try to find the next coin or the next Bitcoin or this is the next thousand X pump. And then they kind of go all in on that one coin, mm -hmm. which... Anytime you go all in, you risk losing everything <laughs> by the very nature of going all in, right? So it almost seems to me that if instead of pick or try to pick the coin that you think is going to do the thousand X, it's probably better to have a very, very small amount invested in a few of them. And then if one of them pumps, it should cover the losses in the ones that don't. That seems like a better strategy to me personally, but I'm not really an altcoin guy. But right. I would certainly say to anyone that thinks, oh, I found the next Bitcoin or the next Ethereum or the next thousand X meme coin. I would certainly say that, you know, size your position, because if it's really going to do a thousand X, you don't need to put your whole net worth in it. <laughs> right. You you can get away with just putting a bit in there and then you'll probably kind of be OK. So, yeah, I mean, as ever, there, there's risk with all of this stuff, but it's kind of like a learning process. Right. You have to kind of you have to kind of get wrecked a few times to be able to figure out what is the right posture in, what's the right size in. And, and overall, ultimately you need to make these mistakes first so that you can, you can learn how to actually size your positions, actually manage the risk, and then actually capture some decent gains through a crypto cycle. There's a good saying that is if you, the, the, the first cycle that you experience in this crypto space is for getting wrecked and learning right <laughs> the second cycle is for building experience and the third cycle is for actually making money and again it comes back to what we were saying earlier about having a long-term perspective is certainly the play in my humble opinion yeah i've kind of realized like if i like you said instead of position sizing if i just spread out you know especially with stocks <laughs> if there are stocks and i get anywhere from 10 to 100 or a thousand shares of something depending on the the price of it and i have eventually get a certain amount of those things and just pretty much leave my portfolio alone for the most part and don't get in my own way like i'm going to be much better off and if i then just have that stacking mentality of just trying to build an a, a you know steady like spread out portfolio of assets that are going to be good and stuff like that and i, I wanted to say with the position sizing like you said or going all in i think like yeah it was my strategy looking at gala and saying hey it went to a dollar last time if we do the same thing like that would hit make me a million dollars basically so i tried to go for that approach um or i think it was about half of that what it would have been either way uh but that's it was again that same trap of like i want to hit this arbitrary number let me try to hit a home run and then of course i would have been much better off uh, spreading my positions and position sizing into different uh, coins or stocks or whatever it is like that. But uh, going all in, I wanted to ask on that, uh, dude, why are people 
so obsessed with XRP in your opinion? Because I think there are a lot of people who are obsessed with XRP or going all in on it. And I just don't, I don't get it. Um, <laughs> it's so strange that you asked me that. So as you know, I'm not an altcoiner. At least that's how I present, right? I yeah. present as somebody that's not an altcoiner. Full disclosure in the member section, we've got at the moment, probably let's say two on the watch list and one that I'm actively long. And it's not something I'm proud of, to be honest. But at the same time, I'm a trader, right? I, I have full discretion to choose what I want to trade and, mm -hmm. and it is what it is. And so I, I really don't like altcoins mostly for the reason, well, there's two reasons. One is I find them incredibly tough to manage risk, right? They, they pump, they dump, they can be rugged, they can be hacked. They can have, there's all these risks and you, you can't really manage them in the same way. And I have long been a proponent of using the crypto related equities like Coinbase, MicroStrategy, uh, the mining, uh, the, the crypto miners. I much prefer to use those because you can actually manage risk. And if you go from the bear market lows to today, most of them have done a good couple hundred percent. And that's the bad performing ones that the, the ones that have done well have done significantly more. So I have long been a proponent of that. And I'm not really into altcoins. The second reason I'm not into altcoins is because not only can't you manage the risk as well, but I believe they take liquidity from Bitcoin that is rightfully Bitcoins. I believe mm. people just kind of create these these altcoins. And I know a bunch of them are allegedly going to fix problems that don't yet exist. Or right, they, right. That's a good way to say it. Say again, sorry? That's a good way to say it. They don't really exist yet. It's not yeah, a burning yeah. problem. Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of solving problems that don't exist. Many of them are openly jokes, right? We go like, oh, Pepe coin is a meme. Okay, yeah. great. But why <laughs> Why should that have a hundreds of billions of market cap? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Right. And I, I've long been thinking if we scrapped the entire altcoin market, all of that liquidity could go to Bitcoin and we might actually have a chance of having a non-confiscatable, immutable ledger that cannot be inflated, that cannot be confiscated, that cannot be manipulated. I personally think that might be better for humanity than having two and a half million mm. or altcoins that don't really fix any real world problems yet. And I know there's going to be some people that push back and yeah. say, yeah, well, Camel, this one and that one and this one and that one are actually doing things. I I'm not saying none of them do anything, right? That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is the vast majority of these two and a half million odd altcoins that we have, they don't need to exist. They're just taking liquidity from what I think would be better put in Bitcoin. I think the world would probably be a bit of a better place if we put that liquidity in Bitcoin and had more Bitcoin adoption than if we had a bunch of people trading these degenerate sort of meme coins or whatever. And so that's kind of my idea for the altcoin market, right? I'm not really about it. I think Bitcoin is better for humanity. I That's why I focus on, on Bitcoin. And yeah, fine. In the member section, we trade one or two altcoins and I'm not really proud of it, but <laughs> if they're going to go up, you know, and they've got a clean setup, that's fine. Anyway, when it comes to XRP, XRP is kind of a very weird thing for me because I actually hold a bunch of XRP. I have held a bunch of XRP for a long time. And the reason for this is because I think when we look at how integrated it is to the banking system, it seems to be that there's a potential for this thing to somehow end up being part of the future of finance. Now, I think the reason the XRP community are so, what's the word for this? they're so cultish around the token is because from their perspective, this thing is guaranteed to go to hundreds of dollars per token, which is, you know, massive, massive increases. I don't mm -hmm. know what the deal is with people thinking that for me, I bought a bag a long time ago. I put it in cold storage. I've never really thought about it. And I have an open trade on the YouTube channel as well. I don't really know, but for me personally, it seems to be integrated into important places enough that it seems better to have some than not mm -hmm. now i am not in this camp of people that says it's going to 500 dollars a coin <laughs> i'm mm -hmm. not in this camp of people that says they're going to back it by gold i'm not in this camp of people that says it's guaranteed but moreover i am in this camp of people that says how else do you hedge bitcoin right if bitcoin were to fail what is the coin that would possibly accelerate to the upside and from my perspective that would be xrp and i know a lot of people will say that is an absolutely nonsense argument and that's fine but it is integrated with a whole heap of banks and a whole heap of financial platforms and out of all of the altcoins i never see the creators of any of the altcoins sitting on the board with central bankers or with the imf or with 
these other sort of high level three letter organizations but you do mm. see the ceo of ripple <laughs> sat on these boards with these very very high um high level people from positions of power so xrp is a very very weird one for me i don't like to cover it i don't like to shill it i have a trade like i say on the on the channel which has been open for some time it hasn't done a whole heap of anything xrp token doesn't seem to move very much <laughs> most of the time but i think that's what it is i think if you look at what most of these altcoins are trying to solve or most of these altcoins are involved with they kind of all fit under this blanket term of they're solving problems that don't exist and maybe that's true of xrp as well but like i said when we look at the the ceos and the cfos they're sat on the boards you can find photos of them on google sat next to like the imf and the bis and they're involved in that the xrp and ripple is being named in these sort of basel 3 and basel 4 agreement documents so it's very very strange will it pump i have no idea but it was so cheap. I mean, I think my entry is something like 10 cents. I bought a bunch of 10 cents. It's currently up about 5x since then. I, I don't really look at the price. I don't really care. I just yeah. kind of bought a bunch of this. I put it away and I said, you know, if someday we end up in a CBDC future <laughs> and this is the most likely candidate to take over, then at least I got a bag of it, right? But I don't really believe in it per se. I don't really think that people should be super cultish around it. I see an awful lot of speculation that I don't agree with. So it's a very, very weird one. But like I say, it is the only altcoin that I actually hold in size that's not a trading position. It's the only one I own. Of a, I, I own Bitcoin cold stored and I own Bitcoin trading positions. And then I own XRP cold stored and I've got an XRP trading position. Outside of that, I hold zero other altcoins. So very weird. But like I said, I can't, I could never get away from the fact it seems super integrated with too many high level financial people for me to ignore. So maybe that's the reason. And I wouldn't rule out them creating some new token <laughs> that completely stuffs yeah. all of the XRP holders. So they never get to make any money, right? They just, I wouldn't rule them out saying, okay, we're finally going to use the Ripple ledger system or whatever, but then they just kind of scrap the XRP token. I wouldn't rule that out either, but I have been. Yeah. I have been a holder for some time and I, I was kind of just thought I would put it on a cold storage and just leave it there forever, basically. That's always been my approach. Yeah, it, I think it, that question kind of spawned by me just like seeing that you were covering it on your channel because people were asking you about it. And to me, I was like, man, like, why are people still into this XRP story? And I, I think what you said is really uh, good and enlightening as far as like the fact that they have connections with a lot of high level people. To me, that's the strongest, you know, case for it. But like you said, it's it's kind of a lottery ticket in my mind. And if it is going to 100 or 500 a coin at some point, like then in my mind, I would just put in, you know, a few hundred bucks or a thousand, whatever it is, and just say, hey, if it goes to zero, that's fine. If it goes to 100, that's great. And wake me up when either one of those happens because I'm not paying attention to it till then because it just kind of seems like wasted energy to constantly be, you know, thinking about it. And I'm like, there's, there's other things to give your energy to, but yeah, I mean it, the same thing. That's how I view the meme coins. Like you said, Pepe, <laughs> I have Pepe and uh, the way I, I was like, let me just buy some. I think I put in a hundred bucks and it's already like 10 X from back last year or something. And I'm like, I'm just going to hang out. Like I'm not selling it because I'd rather just play it like a lottery ticket. And if something happens and we do go into like a, a longer bull run in the future and it pumps, you know, that's, that's great. But, you know, either way, it's fine. Like, I don't really care. Um, but yeah, the ones that I do seem like I'm conflicted about are the political coins. Like, in my mind, I'm like, I know these are going to pump. But at the same time, I feel like buying those kind of puts me in a position where I don't know if I like it, where I'm more into whatever's going on in politics or something like that. And I'm biased because I have a holding and a position that's reflected in a political candidate. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you something yeah. else that's weird about XRP, right? And you know, don't don't conflate this as me <laughs> shilling this coin or suggesting anyone should buy it or anything like that. This is just simply a statement of objective fact, right? XRP is the only altcoin with legal clarity, mm. <laughs> right? It's the only one that has faced the SEC and been determined not a security. Mm. And maybe Ethereum is about to be, right? Maybe, maybe that's how they get their ETF through and and who knows. But it, it, 
to me, it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting that that's the only one that actually has true legal clarity. And I don't think that can be ignored. Again, I, I, this is by no means me saying I think it's going to pump, but it was it was a coin that I thought to myself, you know what, out of all of the altcoins, this seems to be the one that I would want to hold. And like I say, I just bought a bag of it and I put it on cold storage and I forget about it. And if one day it's worth a bunch, then it's fine. And if not, well, I'm not going to notice it. Yeah, I like that. And and that answers another question I was going to ask you is if you were ever to hold, hold an altcoin or a meme coin, which one would it be? So I guess it's XRP. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I don't like the meme coins at all. I think for me, I just can't manage the risk. Like unless yeah. I'm putting in a fraction of a fraction of 1% of my net worth, then right. and it's a ride or die position. I, I don't much like that. If I mean, there was a time a few years back last cycle where I had quite a bunch of quite a significant amount of Ethereum. And after they announced they were moving to proof of stake, I just sold the whole lot and I never looked back to it. Uh, excuse me. I never looked back. So, so yeah, I mean, XRP is the only one that I hold and the rest of them just don't really do it for me. Um, mm -hmm. Also, XRP happens to be one of those ISO coins, ISO 2, triple O, double two or whatever it is. Um, I know H bar is one of those and there's a few others. I forget the names of them. And again, maybe that's nothing, right? <laughs> maybe that's literally nothing or maybe they are planning to build CBDCs on top of all of this stuff. I, again, make the point that the best thing for humanity is to stop messing around with this stuff <laughs> and put the liquidity into Bitcoin and then force the Bitcoin adoption. And then I think we actually have a shot of saying no to CBDCs. But at the same time, I don't know how else to hedge apart from to play one of these ISO coins. So, I mean, that was my decision. Like I said a minute ago, it is what it is, right? Like if it goes up, it goes up. And if it doesn't, I don't care. So... <laughs> Right. Yeah, dude, I've been following crypto for probably five years. I don't even know what the ISO thing is, but that's it's uh, that's uh, another topic, the, I guess. But I don't really I ahead. don't really know what it is either, but it, it's some kind of like regulatory framework. OK, um, there's I think a basket of like eight altcoins that fit into this specific framework. And as far as I can tell, it's to do with CBDCs, which, again, like no one wants. Right. No one wants the CBDCs. I think. Some of them are to do with digital IDs and social credit scores and all this kind of weird dystopian stuff. And again, I don't really support any of this, of course. I think, again, it speaks to let's put the liquidity in Bitcoin and actually try to have <laughs> non-confiscatable, immutable, pristine money. But at the same time, the reality of the situation is there is a entire regulatory framework built around a handful of these allegedly chosen coins. and if we're going to move into a CBDC system, then it seems to me that those eight coins are probably going to play a part in it. So I don't hold all eight. Maybe if I was smarter, I would. I kind of just want to hold Bitcoin, right? Cold store it. And like I said, focus on <laughs> hopefully having non-confiscatable pristine money. But I mean, time will tell, right? Time will tell. But assuming Bitcoin went to zero, then what's the next best one? What's the next one that's going to overtake it? And when I look at around the space, <laughs> I don't know. XRP seems like the only one, like I said, with people having seats at the tables that are important. So, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, man, I've never heard anyone say that before about taking all the liquidity out of altcoins and putting them into bitcoins, because that would 100 percent be a game changer in a lot of ways, not just monetarily. But that's really cool that that you said that I've never actually considered that possibility before. But yeah, man, I wanted to get into Bitcoin really quick. And because <coughs> I mean, the, when I found your channel, you were talking about something about like a left translated cycle and a possibility that the markets could see a melt up with, um, you know, basically this completely different theory that I'd heard anyone else talking about. And that immediately kind of like made you stand out to me and just the the way you speak your communication and your consistency on the channel has i think been a huge thing for you the fact that i think since i've been following you put out a new video what seems like every single day and that's incredible man uh can you talk about just like bitcoin and how you've kind of learn to understand it and then like how you've kind of arrived on that left translated cycle theory with the stock market melt up yeah, so the left translation was an idea based 
that, that, that I came up with around 2020. And it really isn't, it really isn't that complicated. It, mm-hmm. It's just that only the cycle traders kind of are aware of this thing, right? So cycles, and this this pertains to hourly cycles, daily cycles, weekly cycles, or multi-year cycles. Obviously, Bitcoin has this wider sort of four-year approximately cycle. But what we see is in a bullish cycle, it gets broken down into four smaller cycles. And the first three, if it's bullish, right translate meaning the peak forms after the halfway point and then we see a major low and then we get another cycle the peak forms after the halfway point qualifying it as right translated we get cycle low and this thing repeats three times but typically and and of course there's a market anything can happen and you know there's always an element of randomness and chaos associated with markets but typically speaking after we've had three right translated cycles the fourth one we should expect more often than not to left translate and so Bitcoin just so happens to undergo these four-year cycles and the first three right translated. So on a balance of probabilities, it seemed only reasonable to expect the fourth one perhaps to left translate. And so that was my base case idea. And the funny thing was, I was thinking, well, if that's true, what we should see is everyone expect a normal four-year Bitcoin cycle to repeat. And instead, Bitcoin should just mercilessly <laughs> accelerate to the upside, clear its all-time high before the halving, and leave everyone sitting there scratching their heads, saying, "Well, <laughs> how on earth did that happen? I didn't think that was I didn't think that was possible. Bitcoin's never done that before, right? Everyone's been trained to look left and say, "Well, yeah, you know, it kind of bases for a while, about a year, and then it starts to move up towards the halving, and then the halving happens, and we have this sell-off, and then you know, a few months later, it kind of grinds up to ultimately start the bull phase, and." My whole idea was, well, we've seen three right translated cycles. So the fourth one should left translate, meaning whilst everyone is expecting that, we should just expect this thing to rip straight to all-time highs. And it did, right? It it printed a new all-time high before the halving. And at that point, I was saying, well, this looks an awful lot like a a left translated cycle. This seems an awful lot like what, what we would expect to see from the fourth cycle in the context of this sort of 16 year super cycle. And it's only until fairly recently that we spent a a few, I think what we spent something like 14 or 16 weeks somewhere in that neighborhood consolidating around the all-time high that suddenly people are doubting it again. Suddenly people are saying, well, we can't possibly accelerate and continue. But all we, the only missing component is to see a final leg higher in Bitcoin and then a top form. And then, (laughs) you know, for most people, they will be able to look at this and say, well, Bitcoin never did that before. I don't, I don't understand. I thought we were supposed to be continuing up into late 2025 and then have a 12 month bear market just like we've always had but the reality is the cycle traders have seen this dozens or hundreds of times and this would just be normal cycle stuff so that was how i came up with the idea of left translated it it all kind of made sense because whether we're on smaller time frames or larger time frames like i said if you if you see three right translated cycles you expect the fourth one to left translate and so that was kind of like the whole premise for bitcoin and it begs the question, like, is that in play? And we don't really know, right? Because the only way we can know is the halfway point of the cycle is November of this year. If a top happens to form before November, then it qualifies as left translated. And Mm -hmm. from a theory perspective, that's normal and to be expected. If, however, we happen to set a new all-time high after November of this year, then it will qualify as right translated. And a lot of people seem to get mixed up and they think that this is some kind of prediction or mm-hmm. some kind of call or whatever. And it really isn't. All it is, is the translation of a cycle is an observation based on where the peak forms relative to that halfway point. So it's not about clout. It's not about saying, I told you so. It's not about saying, oh, well, you know, <laughs> here's where it is. And no one saw this coming apart from Camel. It's nothing to do with that. It's just simply if the peak forms before November of this year, then that is left translated. And if it should happen to form after November of this year, that would qualify as right translated. So we're not really going to know until the end of the cycle Mm -hmm. when we can look back with hindsight and say, well, where was the all-time high? And (laughs) was it before or after November of this year? Only then will will we be able to say with certainty that it was either a left translated or a right translated cycle. But like I said, the, the whole idea for cycles is we see in a bullish uptrend, which Bitcoin has been in, right? Since its inception, it's, it's gone up loads and then down for 12 months and up loads and down for 12 months. And so, like I said, by the time we get to this fourth cycle, 
more often than not, we should expect them to left translate. So that's how I arrived at this idea. And then given that everyone was calling for lower numbers, retest the lows, 10, 12, 14K, whatever the number was, and we just kept going up until finally we reached a point where we printed an all-time high before the halving, when for me, that was like absolute confirmation, right? Yeah. It's like we've never printed an all-time high before the halving before. And now all of a sudden there it is, all-time high before the halving. <laughs> and I saw people coming out and saying, well, inflation adjusted, it doesn't count, right? Inflation mm -hmm. adjusted, we haven't made an all-time high. But I was thinking, well, do you do that for the Dow Jones? Do you do that for the S&P? Like you probably don't, right? Do you do that for gold? No, like the price made an all-time high before the halving. It's got all the familiar symptoms and characteristics of a left translated cycle. And ultimately, if it was to top here or have one final squeeze up and then top before November, that would just be cycles doing cycle things. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people would not be ready for that. But then again, that kind of makes sense since a lot of people aren't cycle traders, right? They don't have that sort of broader understanding of how cycles work. So it's been a hypothesis and it's still a hypothesis that's being tested because like I said, we don't really know, right? If, if an all-time high occurs after November, then it's completely invalidated. And if the all-time high forms before November, then left translation and that makes perfect sense from a cycle perspective. But ultimately we won't really know until we've seen the next bear market low, which is due around the end of 2026. Because, you know, <laughs> even if we see what appears to be a major peak before November, there's always the outside chance that it could be a double pump and end up being right translated, right? So, I mean, it's a work in progress and we're testing it every day and we're tracking it every day. And so far, it seems to have all the familiar symptoms of a left translated cycle. But as I said, we won't really know until we get much later on, you know, towards the end of, let's say, towards the end of 2025, we should have a very, very high degree of confidence in calling which the translation was. And as soon as we see an all-time high, post November, then we can say emphatically that it is indeed a right translated cycle. But as it stands in this current moment in time, it looks more like a left translated cycle to me than a right translated cycle. So yeah, yeah. And I think it was pretty interesting because like I found your channel and then you were talking about that. And I was like, okay, this is completely different than anything I've ever heard anyone talking about with crypto. I need to follow this guy and like keep up with what he's talking about. And then kind of over the next few months, it started happening. And that was like the cool part to see is that I was like, man, like this actually looks like it's playing out. Um, and I know, like you said, it's a, just a hypothesis, but I think the like, Luckily for me, and I think hopefully a lot of other people is like, if you're depending on when you buy, it makes it a lot easier because if I was buying mostly during the uh, bear market and just kind of like, you know, at this point now, it's just like, we'll see what happens. But it, if you're trying to buy at this point right now, it's kind of tricky. But if you've been buying during the, the bear market or years before that, at this point now, we're just kind of like in wait and see mode. But I think either way, like you said, if if we do retrace and then we go into a typical bull market again in 2025 and have like a normal right translated cycle, that's even better and even easier. But like if not, then it just comes sooner. It's probably a lower top and we get our result a little bit faster and then we can look at what's the next trade after that. That's like more of a long term approach. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's very weird because I mean, all of trading is like that, right? All of trading is like you have an idea. And then you have an invalidation and no one really knows. And a lot of people like to present as if they know. A lot of people like to be prediction guys where they say, well, this will happen and that will happen. But the reality is it's a market and nobody knows. Anything and everything is on the table all the time. And yeah, the right translated cycle is on the table as much as the left translated is, right? It, like I said earlier, all it really is is a observation of where the peak forms relative to the halfway point, which happens to be around November. So I actually would like to be invalidated <laughs> <laughs> That's because awesome. if I'm invalidated, that means we're going to continue to run higher later into next year. And that means we should probably expect a higher ultimate number to be the top. And we would also have an easier job of selling the top because relative to where the next cycle low is due, the next four year cycle low, we should be able to, by the time we get into month 30 to 36, we should be saying, okay, well, any breakdown here is likely for real a breakdown, right? Mm -hmm. Like it really is about to be a true technical breakdown that results in a multi-month bear market before that next four-year cycle low. So 
that would be much easier to deal with. And I actually would rather see a right translated cycle. But given that I'm a cycle trader and I've seen a bunch of cycles, <laughs> this current one happens to have all the familiar symptoms of a left translated cycle. And until it invalidates that idea, then I kind of feel silly to say that I want to entertain anything else, right? Like it needs, the market needs to prove me wrong for me to be willing to adjust my stance. But all the while it hasn't proved me wrong, all the while it keeps looking like a left translated cycle, then unfortunately we kind of have to entertain that as a real possibility. And the reason I don't want one is because let's say we get one final squeeze to the upside and we say, okay, Camel says that looks an awful lot like a left translated cycle. That will be me lightening up my position massively, if not selling all of it. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem then becomes somewhere after that left translated cycle top, we would expect to see a big decline to the downside. The problem becomes that after that decline initially to the downside, there will be what I consider to be a low probability bounce. So you could imagine a squeeze higher to 100K, let's say arbitrarily, and then a decline to 60K, and then a bounce comes, right? And out of that bounce, we have to play the bounce, right? We have to get another position on just in case out of that bounce, we move significantly beyond the prior all-time high and onto a right translated cycle. But I consider this to be a low probability bounce because on a balance of probabilities, we should expect this cycle to be left translating. So if we top at 100K arbitrarily and then decline to 60K, I'm going to have to get along there knowing full well that most probably that breakout is going to fail and we're going to roll over and continue a bear market that extends all the way to the end of 2026. Mm -hmm. Meaning I'm going to have to enter a position and then get stopped out, right? <laughs> so this is why I don't want a left translated cycle because if we've got a right translated cycle, then all we have to do is ride the trend into mid to late next year. And then we can be super, super confident that any breakdowns that occur are ahead of that four-year cycle low, meaning I'm absolutely confident exiting the market, sitting on the sides, waiting for the bear market low to show up. And then that four-year cycle low, I go back to full exposure. But if we top, let's say in the next few months, right? <laughs> As I said, I have to exit my position because the base case is, well, that's a left translated cycle. Then we see a decline. And then I realistically have to get back in. I have to play this bounce just in case I'm wrong about left translation, right? Just in case we go to 100K, back to 60, and then on to 300. Well, I don't want to miss that move, right? So mm -hmm. I've got to play that low probability bounce on the way down, knowing that it is indeed a low probability bounce and I might have to pay a stop. So I really, really don't want a left translated cycle. A lot of people seem to have a real issue with this. They seem to think that I want to be able to say, I told you so, or <laughs> put my name on it, sort of stamp it as a brand, you know, Camel's left translated it. I really don't want it. I want a right translated cycle. It would be way easier to deal with. We'll get a higher number. It'd be easier to sell. But as it stands at the moment, the only missing component is one final move higher. And if we were to get that over the next couple of weeks, then <laughs> that'll be me exiting the market. And like I said a million times already, I'll have to play a low prob a low probability bounce on the way down. So, yeah. Market psychology. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just a wild, it's a it's a wild situation to have to deal with because I won't be able to trust that bounce, but I will have to play it just in case we have this initial pump to 100 k correct. And then off we go to 300 or 400 or who knows, right? So I'll have to play that bounce, but I won't want to. Right. Market psychology would suggest that that would be a, a bounce. You know, it would not get back to 100K. It'd be like 75 or something. And then we we go back down again. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's if it's left translated, it's much easier. It's We're just following something we've seen before, but maybe a little bit uh, different of a chart pattern because we have maybe a little bit more liquidity now. And then um, with you know, like you said, if it's right translated, then it just puts us kind of in a more uncharted territory, which we we have a theory, but we just have to take a little bit more risk with how it's going to no, go. No, no, no. It's the, it's the other way around. Or, yeah, so yeah. If, I'm sorry. If I said it wrong. If it's, yeah. yeah if, it's, if it's left translated, that's difficult to deal with because we won't know if the initial sell-off is really the top or if we'll have to buy a breakout halfway down and then watch it become right translated. But what we should be hoping for is a right translated cycle because by the time we get to the middle to late of 2025, then any breakdown that occurs there, we can have absolute confidence in that that really is the top and we can just sit out of the way, right? We don't have to play any more bounces until that bear market low and that four year cycle low comes in. So, so that's what I hope for, but who knows, right? Who knows?
Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I see the chart patterns in my mind. I just said it the wrong way when I was explaining it. So yeah. again, that just like uh, sums up again, like how uh, impressive it is what, of what you do, because understanding these things and actually explaining them in a way that's coherent for people to understand in a YouTube video is two completely different things. So you have <laughs> to have that practice and communication skill of understanding your theory to the point you can talk about it almost relentlessly and be able to explain, you know, what, what all is going through your head. Cause it's so easy to just not be able to explain something that you understand, you know? Sure. Sure. So, yeah, man, uh, definitely. I wanted to ask you before you go, I, I know you love fishing. What, what, <laughs> what is, uh, why do you love fishing, man? And tell me about like, do you do freshwater fishing, saltwater fishing? What, what do you like to do, man? Um, so primarily i do saltwater fishing okay i do uh, as a teenager as a late teenage teenager i used to do a lot of match fishing we call it here which is like competition carp oh, fishing cool um and i was actually pretty good at that I won, I won a few uh won a few trophies doing that but mostly speaking i do sea fishing and I guess the reason for that is just because I happen to live about, if I drive 20 minutes in any direction, I end up at a bunch of beaches. So it's the most convenient. I grew up very poor. <laughs> so um, yeah, like it's a cheap hobby, right? I can go and dig worms from the local estuary and then take them to the sea and fish them in the sea. And it doesn't cost anything practically. So I think that's probably how I got into it. Just growing up from a poor background and happening to live by the sea um and and yeah it's, it's just been something i've done ever since i was a child my brother is equally as into it i've got two brothers one of them absolutely <laughs> one of them absolutely hates it and the other one is a hundredfold more passionate about it than i am but we, mm. we try to get out and if nothing else sitting on the beach with your brother and uh having a beer and whatever else and just taking in the scenery you know that's a good way to spend the day in my humble opinion and uh occasionally we catch some fish yeah so I yeah like it. it's been something i've done since i was a child really legit yeah me too i actually grew up in a, a property where i mean i say property that sounds fancy basically my house back in mississippi where i grew up we had uh some acreage and we had about three ponds spread out over the property um and dude i didn't know how blessed i was to have all that space to grow up in um you know and in, in my mind i was like i'm living in mississippi there's not a ton going on here but just having that countryside and i could just go walk around in the woods walk around in pastures go take my rod down to the the pond and catch we, we have a uh, brim here and bass uh so i don't know if you're familiar with those two types of fish yeah i am yeah Okay, nice. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm a big fan of just throwing the cork out there and you know watching it, and then when you start seeing it move, you get excited. Uh, but yeah, it was amazing. I I did a ton of fishing with my dad back in the day. Nice. Yeah, there are. Um, we've got the European sea bass, and that's like the the number one most prestigious. <laughs> that's that's the best eating fish that we've got to yeah. offer. Um, okay. So about April ish, they come in. And they stay around and they'll take lures until around September-ish. And they're really good eating. And they can be a bit of a problem fish to catch sometimes and other times not so much. It really depends year to year. Uh, in the UK, we kind of have to fish for whatever it, whatever's in front of us on the month. Okay. So it requires a, a knowledge of what's there on that given month and what baits it wants. And it's very kind of specific. We don't really get to say, Oh, I fancy going out after this fish today. We kind of have to be like, well, what month is it? <laughs> Are the crabs in or not? And then we kind of have to figure it out from there. So we just have to kind of fish for whatever's in front of us. But, but yeah, the bass season is kind of April ish. They start to come in, like I said, until September. And by the end of September, they'll take lures off the surface. And that is like the best sport. That's, that's absolutely the best sport you can find in in the uk in my opinion so yeah it's really really good and they're really really good eating they don't look like your bass funny enough they kind of mm. do but they're a completely different color um but yeah fantastic eating and fantastic sport one of the hardest fighting fish we got so they're always like the number one target but they they can be a bit finicky to catch they that they, they seem a bit smarter than other fish so it mm. so, makes yeah. them even more enjoyable probably when you do catch them yeah, for sure, for sure. And often they swim around like it's quite easy to catch the smaller ones, but the bigger ones can be can be quite hard to get. And obviously we've got a um we've got a 42 centimeter limit here. So you're not allowed to take them home unless 
they're over 42 centimeter that's so, that's pretty big isn't it it is quite big but to be honest we needed it because people kept eating them <laughs> under <laughs> size and then they the numbers really did drop off and you got stories of all sorts of fishermen that haven't seen one in many many years um, wow. but they bought that in uh, they bought that in a few years ago and it's been well respected and ever since then the bass fishing has gotten a lot better every year so so yeah i think it was a i think it was a necessary implementation and it certainly seemed to work but but yeah it is quite a big fish it's quite a big fish to be able to actually catch and take home yeah Dude, that's amazing, man. Dude, I, I really, really appreciate you coming on and doing this with me because I, it, it went so well in my mind. And I, it's just awesome to talk to you in person after, you know, like so many months and almost a year or more of following you and listening to your channel. Like you're, you just seem like an awesome guy ever since I've been following you. So I really appreciate your taking the time, man. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. I had a blast. And uh, yeah, if you want to do another one, let me know. <laughs> you got it. I, I wanted to end with a quote that you said that is one of my favorite things that you said. It's when you're so rich that you want to show your wife how much money you've made, that's the perfect time to sell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So me and, my, me and my wife have an agreement that if I ever show her a screenshot of profit or an account balance or anything like that, she is mandated to force me to sell at least half in front of her. And if I don't, then she's been under strict instruction to hit me over the back of the head until I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, anytime, anytime that you are flashing profits around or feeling good, then you should, instead of feel good, you should be thinking to yourself, wow, something bad is about to happen. And it works every time, right? If you don't sell, then you're about to get wrecked. So so yeah, if you've got a significant other, let them know. If you ever show them a screenshot of profit or anything like that, <laughs> make it a rule. You have to sell it at least half in front of her. And uh, it, it works for me, at least. Yeah, and then take them out to a nice dinner for sure. Exactly, because no matter how much you spend on dinner, you would have lost way more by holding the position. <laughs> exactly. It's an awesome rule, man. Thank you so much, Camel. No problem. Thanks for having me. You got it, man. We'll talk soon. we Will do. Cheers. Bye. All right. Bye.